Welcome to the video presentation on anaphylaxis in schools, and it's based on legislation passed in the 2014 regular legislative session. My name is Janelle Lee, and I'm the Executive Officer of the Alabama Board of Nursing. This is a continuing education program that you will receive half a contact hour because the presentation is about 30 minutes. There's an objective that we have to meet, and that is following your participation, you will be able to identify the portions of the law that are applicable to stocking epinephrine in the schools. The National Association of School Nurses recognized the need for stock epinephrine in the schools based on studies that showed that about 25% of all first-time anaphylaxis events occur in schools. Because the individual who has the anaphylaxis event did not know about the allergy, they don't have a prescription for a preloaded epinephrine injection. During the 2014 regular legislative session, Representative Tuggle and Senator Watley sponsored legislation to allow for stock epinephrine in the schools. The big question we've received is who pays for this? You can consider in your local education agency to develop a policy of replacement. For example, if stock epinephrine is used for an individual with first-time anaphylaxis, perhaps that individual could replace the epinephrine that was used for them or the LEA may in fact decide to fund the stock epinephrine themselves. But there are several different ways you could approach paying for this. Now the law is Act number 2014-405. This is actually on the board's website. If you click on Nursing Practice and then School Nurses, Act 2014-405 is available for you to download. I'm not going through every individual section of this, but I will go through the sections that are critical to your understanding. The first section is that the State Department of Education is responsible for developing an anaphylaxis preparedness program to be adopted by each local board of education and implemented in each K through 12 public school commencing with the 2015-2016 scholastic year. The Alabama State Board of Pharmacy shall provide guidance, direction, and advice to the State Department of Education in developing and administering the anaphylaxis preparedness program. The law also specifies that the anaphylaxis preparedness program incorporate three levels of prevention that are initiated by the licensed public school nurse as part of the health services program. First is level one or primary prevention. This is educational programs that address food allergies and anaphylaxis through both classroom and individual instruction for both staff and students. Level two is secondary prevention, which is identification and management of chronic illness. And level three is tertiary prevention, which is the development of a planned response to anaphylaxis-related emergencies in the school setting. Each local board of education may collaborate with a physician to develop and maintain a protocol for emergency response. The critical Part of this is locating a local physician to work with the school nurse and the local education agency for this protocol. But it includes a supply of pre-measured auto-injectable epinephrine on each public school campus to treat potentially life-threatening allergic reactions. Single-dose auto-injectable epinephrine may be provided to school children by the school nurse or based on the curriculum that currently exists for delegation to unlicensed school personnel then obviously you've been training unlicensed school personnel to have access to uh, pre-measured auto-injectable epinephrine already. And the training program that has been developed, um, will, we will look at the National Association of School Nurses as they do have the recognized training for laypersons in emergency treatment. Training may be conducted online or in person, and at a minimum, the training should cover the techniques on how to recognize symptoms of severe allergic reactions, including anaphylaxis, standards and procedures for the storage and administration of an auto-injectable epinephrine, and emergency follow-up procedures. There is a section that releases liability for school personnel, and also uh, there's a statement in the law that this does not establish a standard of care for physicians. Now, if you can see this, this is from the Secretary of State's website that shows, in fact, that this law was signed by the governor in April of 2014. So even though it does not become effective until the academic year of 2015-2016, 
that gives the State Department of Education and the Board of Nursing time to develop the training program and to look at all aspects of what the law requires. One of the questions that has been asked already about this law is what about staff? And the law is specific for students, but in fact, you do have staff who will also have their first anaphylaxis event occur at school. And so my recommendation would be that you include staff in the training, not only for the recognition of anaphylaxis, but also if, if a staff member needs the auto-injectable epinephrine, that it be made available to them. Um, there are other questions that have come up related to what happens if the um, principal or superintendent says to a school nurse not to send a, an individual to the local emergency department and not to treat for anaphylaxis. Uh, if you have a physician order for stock epinephrine and to administer the epinephrine to those individuals who have their first anaphylaxis event occur at school, then I would say that it's up to the school nurse to make the judgment that whether that individual actually needs to go to the emergency department. Most emergency services and emergency departments recommend that first-time anaphylaxis events do go to the emergency department because that one-time dose of epinephrine may not be sufficient for actually taking care of the anaphylaxis. And they need to be evaluated by a physician in a hospital so that, in fact, if they require additional medications and more medications over the course of time, that that can be given. Do not expect that just giving a one-time dose of pre-measured auto-injectable epinephrine will be enough to manage a child or a staff member of the school who actually has an anaphylaxis reaction. Uh, the, we will now hear from some school nurses who will talk to you about the actual implementation and some of their experiences with this particular law. First up is Melanie Sharpen. Good morning. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to share with you some great news for Alabama school nurses. We are working with the Alabama Board of Nursing this morning to film this presentation. We want to thank them wholeheartedly for this opportunity to use their um, talents and resources so that we can film this presentation and that it can reach school nurses across our state. The title of today's presentation is Advocacy and Evidence-Based Practice for Stock Epinephrine in Schools. I'm one of the um, Epinephrine Resource School Nurses for Alabama, as well as a school nurse in Alexander City School System. The reason that we're doing this presentation today is um, as an Epinephrine Resource School Nurse and the progress within the national movement for stock epinephrine across the U.S., is now landed in Alabama. We're making way with our state legislation to allow schools to stock epinephrine, and we wanted to share this great opportunity with every school nurse so that they may go forth and implement the presentation the program as well. Of course, as this activity has transpired and word has gotten out, school nurses have contacted me wanting to uh, find out more information, asking me to come and present uh, to their systems. I've not been able to do that because I do work full-time as a school nurse, but I did want to um, try to be part of helping get this message out to you all. Some of the questions that we've had posed from school nurses so far, what is the legislation? What are the physician's orders? The protocol details? So to answer those questions, we had some creative energy go into devising this program as well as developing a panel of experts. So today, I have the great opportunity to introduce to you our panel of experts. We have uh, Alabama State Department of Education, the Alabama Board of Nursing Executive Officer, Janelle Lee. We have the Alabama Association of School Nurses President, Tracy Morrow. And we have Madison County's lead school nurse, Jan Ward, here to present you with the continuing information. In 2008, Trace Adkins competed on the um, Celebrity Apprentice with Donald Trump. I never thought in my time watching this show that I would be part of pop culture and seeing it actually take place in our state. 
Trace's charitable organization was the Food and Allergy Anaphylaxis Network, which benefited from his winnings. He had a personal connection with food allergy with his wife Rhonda and their daughter um, that had a reaction to peanut butter. So this is the beginning of pop culture and how pop, pop culture can raise money for research. And of course, with money and research, we get answers. We know that there are 15 million persons in the United States that suffer from food allergies. That equates to one in 13 children or two in every classroom. We know that the foods that are responsible for this, um, there's eight primarily that are responsible for 90% of the reactions, and those are peanuts, tree nuts, milk, egg, wheat, soy, fish, and shellfish. Um, asthma adds to the complexity of food allergies and that one-third of the children that have food allergies also have asthma. So we do see a comorbidity between food allergy and asthma. Food allergies account for 35 to 50 percent of all cases of anaphylaxis in emergency setting. 20 to 25 percent of epinephrine administrations involve students or staff in the school setting whose allergy was unknown at the time of the event. I cannot stress this particular point enough as we go forward through the materials today. Those children and staff that we do not know that may have a first-time reaction on the school campus um, are persons that we stand a great opportunity in saving their lives. And that is why we advocate for this stock epinephrine law to pass. From this point, please allow me to stop and introduce to you our next panelist, Ms. Jan Ward from Madison County Schools. I'll be picking up this discussion when we uh, at the prevention, treatment, and management concepts. Right now, the, the predominant way to manage food allergies in the school setting or severe allergies is to try strict food avoidance. Um, that is not very successful. We can see, I um, mean, if we sat together and talked, most of us as school nurses would agree that poses a tremendous challenge. We have very little control over what students have had to eat prior to coming to school. So therefore, the, the current recommendation is to avoid statements that we have an allergy-free school and use statements instead that say we have an allergy aware school, which brings us right back to our primary prevention, which heightening awareness regarding allergens in the school setting and how to avoid or minimize the exposure risk. Some of those discussions revolve around management plans, which we already have in place for our students that have a diagnosed allergy, um, making sure that staff and faculty are educated in those allergies and in those early symptoms that is involved in your health um, individualized health plan. But then also we have some challenges that students that we have a diagnosis of an allergy, we have a management plan in place, we sometimes have difficulty getting the medication actually at school, either on the child's person or locked with the nurse in her supplies. Parents sometimes don't seem to, or they seem to be hesitant to bring that to school and or they don't respond promptly when we notify them that the supply we do have at school for their child has expired. And I'm, I'm concerned that um, all of us are all too aware of these challenges in managing it currently with what we have in place. As we know, epinephrine is the most reliable first-line treatment for anaphylaxis, and the list of symptoms is there. Oftentimes when we're training our staff and faculty, we do need to remind them that those uh, GI symptoms are just as important of an impending severe reaction as are the respiratory and um, skin reactions that we see and sometimes just only associate with anaphylaxis. It's also important to remember that the first reaction can occur within an hour of exposure to the allergen, but a second or rebound reaction could occur as long as 72 hours after that initial exposure and is often worse than the first. Back in 2011, the Food Safety and Modernization Act was enacted at the federal level. This law actually laid the foundation for primary prevention at the state level and encouraged school systems to develop programs that would heighten awareness among all school staff about food allergies and other allergic reactions related to insect stings. This um, also, there's more information concerning that law and interventions and education with the resources bulleted there on the slide for you. As a follow-up to that law from 2011, 
the School Access to Emergency Epinephrine Act was passed in November of 2013. This law specifically addressed was what would be the secondary level of prevention, which is the, to amend the Public Service Act to increase the preference given in awarding certain asthma-related grants to certain states, and those states being the ones that allow trained school personnel to administer epinephrine and meet other related requirements. This the law permits trained personnel to administer the epinephrine, to maintain a supply and secure but an accessible location, and plans to cover the premises during operating hours, and it does provide some immunity to civil liability as well. This law is important because it does provide a funding stream potentially to states that pass local laws to encourage the school personnel be trained and stock epi be available. Another resource that is excellent is the Myelin Specialty. This is a pharmaceutical company that actually manufactures the EpiPen. And in August of 2012, they, offered, they began a program that offers free auto injectors to schools nationwide. And this website, um, these links that are listed here will give you some more information on that. Dosages, both the EpiPen Junior and the uh, 0.3 milligram dose are available through this program. I now would like to pass the information on to Tracy Morrow, our president for AASN, and she'll continue our presentation. I'm Tracy Morrow. I'm the current president of the Alabama Association of School Nurses, and I'd like to speak to you today about the National Association of School Nurses and what they have to offer. On their website, um, you will find a tool resource kit for food, allergy, and anaphylaxis. It's an excellent tool to use in your school system to develop a program. The National Association of School Nurses also trains epinephrine resource school nurses and in the state of Alabama we're lucky to have three school nurses who have gone through the ERSN training. NASA has an anaphylaxis um, management algorithm on their website and as you can see it's very detailed. Um, it is used to help plan and develop your protocol. In a few moments we will provide you with more information on how to develop a protocol for your own system using this algorithm. I'd like to speak to you about the Epinephrine Resource School Nurses. There are more than 100 ERSNs around the country. Last year at the Alabama Association of School Nurse Conference, we did a Train the Trainer program for school nurses entitled Saving Lives at School. ERSNs are available to help answer questions and provide support. There is a free 20-minute training program on NASA's website, and you do not have to be a member to access this, but it is a training program for you to teach school employees how to use an EpiPen. So that would be an excellent, um, inexpensive resource for your school system. ERSNs have presented to more than 4,000 school nurses in 38 states. State laws for stock epinephrine. As you can see from the, the map of the United States on your left, um, there are several states in dark blue. Alabama, as you notice, is in white. And that means that we don't have, or didn't at the time of this map, have any type of state law regarding stock epinephrine. This map was published in November of 2013. The map to your right is present day, and you'll see Alabama's in gray. We currently have um, pending legislation that we're very, very proud of. In November of 2013, Alabama had no existing laws regarding stock epinephrine. On February the 21st, Alabama's um, epinephrine resource school nurses sought guidance from the Board of Nursing on allowing schools to have stock epinephrine. The results of this meeting was um, certainly favorable. National School Board Association also has a um, policy and program that you can review on their website. It's entitled Safe at School and Ready to Learn, a Comprehensive Policy Guide for Protecting Students with Life-Threatening Food Allergies. Um, you have guidelines, a checklist, and an appendix with examples. And this um, is another resource that we used in preparing um, a local school plan. 
The Alabama Association of School Nurses uh, Legislative Committee took the lead in developing a bill for Alabama. House Bill 156, which was sponsored by Representative Tuggle from Alexander City, requires each LEA to adopt and implement an anaphylaxis preparedness program commencing the 2015-2016 school year. The committee members sought input from the State Department of Education as well as the Board of Nursing, the Alabama chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, FAIR, and local school nurses. You can view this, on, this bill on our website at aasn.org. You can also view under our members forms section a local policy developed by Melanie Sharpton for her school district. November 30th, 2013, the Centers for Disease Control came forth with their guidelines for anaphylaxis, and you can find that at cdc.gov. Um, it is a voluntary guideline for managing food allergies in schools and early care and education programs. And it's also an excellent resource for you to use in developing your own program for your school. At this time, Melanie Sharpton will talk to us about her program in the Alexander City School System. Thank you, Jan and Tracy, for this information. Please allow me to share a little bit more um, details with you on how we, Alexander City Schools, um, pioneered this effort. Um, one of our local pediatricians contacted me offering to sponsor getting the stock epinephrine. Um, so we were very fortunate that he made this offer. Um, and I encourage all of the school nurses out there to work very diligently, especially the lead nurse, to, to develop um, your relationships with your local providers um, so that they know what your programs um, consist of and the integrity that you can uh, develop these programs. It, it reassures the physicians that we're doing our jobs to maintain a safe program out there. Um, so from that point forward, I went to our school administrators and offered them um, the information about all of these details that has been shared with you up to this point. The national um, programs, the effort that's happening in the federal legislation, um, as well as our School Nurse Association uh, working to hash out the first bill for our state. Our local administration was very supportive of this concept. However, they did want me to provide with them, for them a little bit more information on how we could actually implement this. Um, we came to the conclusion through a brief presentation at our, at our local board um, the decision from each of our board members was unanimous, 100%. Uh, they voted for us to implement this program. And the way that Alexander City proved this point was by the use of local data. The next slide will show you some of this local data. This um, information here, it, it just breaks down the, the numbers of students that we have with conditions that could put them at risk for or those that we have identified with um, severe allergies. We used INAO and the information um, gathered from INAO to get these numbers. And as you can tell, um, we very easily showed the need for this. Um, based on the numbers, the, the last row on this table shows you the numbers of students that we have with asthma, with inhalers at school, with food allergies, with um, allergies to insects, and the last column in red shows you the numbers that we actually have for students that have their epinephrine. Um, we just did a ratio and we showed in this table that 29.3% of our student population is at risk for contracting severe sudden anaphylaxis. However, we only have 2% of our student population that actually have an epinephrine on school, an epinephrine pen um, prescribed it and on, on their person at school. So this slide alone was all that our school board needed to see how underprepared school nurses are at actually responding to an emergency. 
And I did mention to you uh, several slides back about remembering that 20 to 25 percent of those that have an anaphylactic reaction are unknown at the time. So this particular slide does not even factor in that percentage. This is just those that we know, those identified with a potential problem for anaphylaxis. Um, so I encourage you to use your data in iNow. I can help you accumulate and acquire this information if you're not sure how to do that in iNow. Um, I'll be glad to help you. If you can contact me, I'll, I'll help you get this information. From that point, um, it was really easy for me as one of the state CRSN to pull together information to develop a protocol um, that may be a choice of words um, out there, whether you call it a protocol, whether you call it a policy and procedure, whether you call it a program manual. I can tell you that in order to purchase the medications uh, through Mylan, um, EpiPens for school, you will have to have a physician signed protocol. That information again, as Tracy mentioned, is in the, on the AASN website. Um, I can email you that information as well. We have a draft document. It's a simple program manual that covers the policy, the protocol, a skills training check, check sheet, um, and the administration record. It's very simple, very straightforward. I can send that to you in Word and you can um, draft that or tweak it to, to the needs of your school system. We did send all of this information to our local school attorney, our board attorney, and they approved um, this as a safe guidance as well. In January of 2014, Representative Mark Tuckle, the 81st District covering Lee and Tallapoosa County sponsored a House Bill 156. The um, Senate um, counterpart of that bill was sponsored by Senator Tom Watley of the 27th District who covers Lee Russell in Tallapoosa County. The Alabama Association of School Nurses Committee um, contacted the Alabama Coalition of Nursing Organizations who also offered their support in the bill. The primary focus of this bill is that it will authorize the lead nurse employed by the LEA to collaborate with a local physician to develop and maintain a protocol for emergency response that includes a supply of pre-measured auto-injectable epinephrine on each public school campus. The three levels of prevention that are identified in this bill are primary, secondary, and tertiary. The primary Prevention is for the education and awareness activities that you can employ in your school, in your school setting. The secondary is the identification and management of chronic illnesses. School nurses routinely develop um, individualized health plans and emergency action plans for students with known anaphylaxis. And the tertiary level of prevention for this is a planned response to anaphylaxis emergencies. This is where um, we may encounter an individual that was previously undiagnosed that may have a first time reaction in the school setting and we will have that stock epinephrine readily available for that type of emergency. There are a few limitations um, that we have identified in this process and you might be creative in, in finding the answers for your local education agency. For Alexander City, we don't anticipate stocking any epinephrine on any of our bus routes. Um, for that particular individual that may have an individualized health plan, that child may have their epinephrine with them. For an undiagnosed first-time reaction, the bus driver would follow their, their normal procedures for emergencies on the bus, and that would be call 911. Um, nor do we anticipate stocking epinephrine for our sports events. I can share with you a few local tips um, for implementing the, the protocol, the local education agency guide that we have listed on the AASN website. We decided to stock and store our epinephrine inside of our AED cabinets. We have AEDs throughout all of our schools and at our central office and we have stock epinephrine stored inside of those cabinets. It's a walled cabinet alarmed but it is not locked so it is secure but accessible. Two things that I would like to share with you, we use the Braslow's pediatric tape for um, 
the size and the dosage with the two dosages of epinephrine, you have the 0.15 and you have the 0.3 milligrams. The 0.15 is for children, 33 pounds and under. Um, we use the Braslow tape. We cut a ribbon, a green ribbon, the length of the Braslow tape at that weight. And the green indicates that the person that may be assessing that situation could unroll the green ribbon and determine that the child is that length and the green epinephrine, which is the 0.15 milligrams, would be indicated. So that is how we helped um, lay people determine which dose to use. Of course, if they're longer than the green ribbon, they would use the adult dose. And with the national training, we know that the safest thing to do if you're in doubt is to administer the epinephrine. A couple other things you may want to consider is where your school is located, its proximity to the emergency response system. Um, it's recommended that you have two doses in case there's a, a rebound reaction for the, the patient that's suffering from the anaphylaxis. Um, if it's a 30 minute or more call time for your emergency response system, you may need to really make sure you have that second dose available. Uh, again, that would be something that you need to determine at your local education agency and with the guidance of your emergency response team for your area. Thank you for watching the presentation on anaphylaxis preparedness for the public schools. If you have any questions, you can contact your lead nurse at your local education agency. And if you're the lead nurse, you can contact the Alabama Association of School Nurses to get in touch with the epinephrine resource nurse for the state of Alabama. Or you can contact the State Department of Education. Or as you know, you can always contact me at the Board of Nursing. Thank you.